Good morning, and thank you for joining us on our Classroom to Career series. We are continuing this series with the Texas Farm Bureau is here to join us. Uh, my name is Susan Petty. I'm with the Texas Restaurant Association, and we have Jordan Bartels and Jason from the Texas Farm Bureau. They're going to take us on a um, somewhat unusual path. You know, the, the whole point of this series is to highlight careers that are not necessarily going into culinary arts and restaurant management, but are uh, supporting those industries. So just to give you some ideas. And once again, this is being recorded. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box and Haley will alert us to that. We uh, will also have this stored in our library on our website and she will send out, Haley will send out that link as soon as we get it up and, and load it up into YouTube. So I'd um, like to introduce Jordan to you all for real quick. Uh, she has served as the Associate Director of the um, organization at the Texas Farm Bureau since 2019. She leads the executive outreach efforts and provides resources and classroom materials. These are all aligned educators with the TEKS lessons. Um, the teachers can connect with agricultural to the concepts being learned in the classroom. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Communications and Agricultural Leadership and Development and a Master of Science in Education, both from Texas A&M University. Woo, go girl. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an Aggie mom. So I didn't go, but I paid for two, um, two kids to go through it. So I'm um, very excited to have you all to tour and, and take us down this road. So Jordan, I'll turn it over to you now. Sure, good morning. Welcome everyone. We're excited to be with you today. Um, like Susan said, my name is Jordan Bartles. Um, and she had mentioned my role um, with Texas Farm Bureau. I don't lead the executive outreach efforts. I lead the educational outreach efforts. Awesome. So working with students like you and your teachers, um, to really help connect agriculture to what you're learning in the classroom and to what you do every day um, and giving a unique view um, into that through resources, materials, and opportunities to meet with farmers, ranchers, and producers like you're going to meet with Jason today. And so without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Jason. Um, I, I guess I should say I, am, I work in our home office with Texas Farm Bureau, which is located in Waco, so the center of the state. And I know we're talking to students from all over the state, so we welcome you and we're, we're excited that you're with us. Jason Max is with um, True Harvest Farms. They are a hydroponics farming operation um, where they produce a variety of lettuce, um, uh, different lettuce varieties, I should say. Um, and he's going to tell you a bit more about that today. Um, it's really unique to see their operation. Um, I have been there in person and will tell you it is um, very unique. Um, and it is just eye-opening of how we use technology in agriculture today um, to produce our food. Um, we see this in a traditional farming operation as well, out in the field and how technology is used. But today you're going to get to see it in the hydroponics form, and it is very, um, very unique, and I'm excited that you're going to get to see it. Um, Jason is one of, the, um, uh, one of the owners of the company, and so he is excited to get to share with you um, what they do every day, why they do it, and a little bit of the business behind what they do and how working um, with restaurants and other food providers um, to get food where it needs to go to either to grocery stores or to restaurants um, and how they work with those folks. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. I will tell you, um, he has requested that we want questions. So definitely send in your questions. But Jason has requested that we keep those questions until the end, and he will open up that opportunity to gather those. So if you have questions throughout, make a quick note um, and come back to it when we ask for those questions at the end. Go ahead, Jason. All right. So uh, thank you, Jordan and, and Susan. Uh, my name is Jason Max, and as Jordan said, I'm one of the uh, owners here, managing members of True Harvest Farms. Um, and so I'll give you just a little background on us before we get out into the, the growing operation. We are a, a hydroponic leafy greens farm that was founded in 2017 or incorporated. Uh, we built a facility here that we'll tour th this morning um, in 2018 and then went into production in 2019. Um, of course, COVID hit and the, the world changed as we knew it, um, but had an opportunity to tweak some things here and then ultimately go back into full business back in August of, of last year. So from August to current uh, of 2020 to current day, um, we've gone from door-to-door uh, -door restaurants to wholesaling to, to retailing um, across the state, actually across multiple states, um, but been very blessed in that regard in that we can take 
um, a product that we grow here in Belton, Texas, and share that with uh, people all over, ultimately all over the country. Um, we are uh, a what's considered a semi-automated growing system farm. Um, today we do about three varietals of, of lettuce. Uh, currently in the winter season, we do a butterhead, an oak leaf, and a and a fin star or kind of a leafy um, leaf, if you will, or a green leaf, excuse me, if you will. So I'm just going to take some time um, as we walk through. And the reason kind of holding the questions to the end is just to make sure that get enough time to go through the facility so that you can see it. And then at the end, be able to, to as Jordan said, open it up to questions for any of you. So with that said, um, I'm going to try to hand this off to um, Lexi, who is in Salesforce here, and see if she can video me instead of me walking around and holding this in my face. And maybe we can see a little more perspective. So bear with us one second. Yeah, Zoom. Uh, so where's my flip back? Right there. Okay. So we should be good if you keep that in landscape. Yes. Then we'll walk into the head house here. Um, so we basically have, we're on a thousand acre ranch in Belton. Um, we do coastal hay, pecans, and, and this year we'll do corn. Um, but we had an opportunity to do an indoor grow facility to create a safer product for the world to eat um, than what we are getting every year. You see a romaine scare coming out of, of other parts of, of the world. Um, we, in indoors, have never had, uh, in any indoor farm, have never had an outbreak of E. coli. Um, so it gives us an opportunity to create a safer product for the consumer I and mean, ultimately um, everybody that, that eats that. So we're going to walk through uh, from seed to harvest. And so with that said, we'll start talking through some of the what we do from the automation side. There's some equipment that we'll walk through here shortly. Um, we start with pelleted seed. We, we get about 150,000 seeds a month um, that will grow in the greenhouse into, into a full plant. It takes the growing cycle takes anywhere from 35 to 60 days. We walk down here to the, to the center. So currently we have a lot of material in here with supply chain issues this year. We've had to order a lot more to be able to buffer uh, what's going on in, in industry. Uh, but normally this would be a pretty wide open area. We grow in, in peat. So we source peat from Eastern Europe, from Latvia in these big bales that you see behind me. So that kind of really starts the process as we're going through and, and not using like soil like you would outdoors. Um, so we have to have some sort of medium to grow in. So the medium that we chose to go with was peat. Um, it's organically certified peat that we source from Pinstrup. Um, but we'll bring it in. It goes into this big peat breaker here. Basically, that whole bale of peat goes into the bottom here. There's an elevator that comes up to the top. It just rakes off the top, and then it spits it out two sides. It either comes out into a hopper on all the green equipment that Lexi's uh, videoing right now, or it would come off to the left side here and go down what's called a, into a peat tray filler. And so we made a decision back in 2018. We've gone back over to Finland on, a, on our second trip over there. And one of the farms over there was actually using the green equipment that we'll, we'll review here in just a second. And what it is, is it's a biodegradable paper. So instead of using the plastic pot like we had on the original line here, we're able to take a biodegradable paper that in, in six months time is completely degraded um, and essentially gone. So we're not putting anything into the landfill. So we went from the mindset of, hey, we're going to do a million and a half um, pots a year out of this facility to, and that going into the landfill to, hey, let's go figure out how we do something that's more sustainable than that. So with that said, I'll skip over the plastic part because we don't use that. That's just there for redundancy in the event that we go down and have to use that, pro that product. But 99.9% .9 of what we do comes through this machine. So what it does is it takes this paper that I mentioned earlier right here. And so it just comes in a big roll. It'll actually take that paper, roll it into, form a cylinder with it on this machine called an Elipot. It puts it into, basically puts it in that, that shape of a cylinder, pulls the peat through a vacuum and creates like a big sausage wrap, if you will. So this brown paper here is filled with peat at this point in time. It goes through, cuts it to the dimension that we specify and then creates a pot. And what that looks like on the, back in it's just a little pot of peat like this so that's all peat filled inside there so there's some moisture in there that we add to it but ultimately we've created our own pot so like i said in six months time that will biodegrade to a point where it won't the paper on the outside will be completely gone and then you're left with a, a nutrient rich peat pot 
that you can ultimately take out, spread across a field, use it as fertilizer or reuse it, I should say. So we grow lettuce in it, but we can put it out into the hay field, spread it around, and then we're not sending anything to the landfill. Um, that will come through the Ella pot right here, populate a tray. We use a 54 count tray today. It'll go down a conveyor, ultimately get dibbled, and then we'll walk around it, but we'll put seeds in it as we go down this line. So essentially it's just like a manufacturing facility in that regard. But at the end of the day, our product coming down this line is just a tray full of, of peat pods with seeds in them. So as we walk around the helipod, it re-engages or the line re-engages back into the, the blue and, and red equipment that you see here. So. We use the company out of Italy called Urbanati, so they do horticulture all over the world, um, but very do it very well to automate processes, um, both outdoors and indoors. Um, in this case, we go through a dibble process, which is just the act of creating the depression for a seed to fall into. And so once it's got a depression on that tray coming through, we'll have seeds in these little hoppers right here on each of these, oops, I just dumped a bunch of them, um, <laughs> excuse me, into a, into a hopper on the end here. These are a drum seeder. So what happens is it pulls a vacuum and each one of these, you grab a seed. Each one of these little seeds gets pulled onto a hole in this drum here that's under vacuum. And what it will do is as a tray comes underneath it, it'll actually drop that seed into the hole that's on that tray. So there's a mechanism there that releases that vacuum and then drops the seed into that pot. So once it comes underneath the seed here, and, and the tray is now full of, of pods or the peat pods. It's got, they all have seeds in them. They'll actually come down the conveyor. We'll put some vermiculite over the top of it, which is just a very light porous substance. So what it does is help with aeration and moisture control. And then we'll drop some water over the top. We have basically, it's like a little rainforest that comes underneath here. Um, and then ultimately stacks it back at the end. One of the things that I, I wanna mention um, that we do at True Harvest Farms is we don't use pesticides to treat pests. We actually use beneficial insects. So we buy, every week we buy different types of beneficial insects. You can't see them in here without a microscope, but take my word for it. Um, in this case, there's hypoaspis mites and a hypoaspis mite will just go down and burrow in the pot. And then it will actually look to eradicate pests that we might have. So we have thrips, which everybody in farming probably has outdoors. Um, we have fungus gnats and we have shore flies that we deal with. This is the first, really level of defense that we have to, to start that process of eradicating the pests that come into the facility. So this will take care of the young, um, the larvae of the thrips and the, and the fungus gnats. We'll apply others as we get into the greenhouse and I'll explain that here in a minute. We uh, basically take it off of, the, off of the conveyor, we stack it onto a pallet. So in this case, you can see we have um, about 40 pallet or 40 trays sitting here. And so each one of these now has a, a seed in it, has vermiculite over the top. We've applied the hypoaspis mite, which are these two little mounds you see here. And then we take it from there and we put it into a germination chamber. And so the germination chamber is this big white structure right here. What it does for us is it allows us to shorten that cycle of germination. So in the field, it may be seven to 10 days for lettuce to germinate. We put it into a, a high humidity, um, dark atmosphere. And in that environment, it'll germinate in 36 to 48 hours. So we can shorten that cycle and ultimately we can get more turns as we go through the, the process of growing product every year. Um, so we'll put it in there, let it sit for a couple of days, pull it back out, and then we'll go into the greenhouse. The only thing I want to mention while we're up here still is when we mix, the way that we feed plants is through solution. Um, so we mix um, inorganic minerals with water to create what we call fertigation. And so that's the fertilizer and irrigation. Um, completely made up word to the horticulture industry. But what it does is it allows us to take water through drip lines and through overhead uh, booms and apply food that way, but also apply irrigation. So we have these vats that are set here along the head house wall. So what, the, what that is, is we just mix whatever our recipe is to feed the plants into those. Um, so we have a stock A, stock B that goes to the gutters and then one that goes to the overhead sprayers. We'll see here in a minute in the greenhouse. And then because our water comes in at a high pH level and lettuce likes a lower pH level, we actually use pH down or phosphoric acid to bring that, that pH of that water down. Um, all that is done through the technology that we employ here. So we have a system that we purchased out of, uh, of Finland, um, one of the few mobile goalie systems in the world uh, in terms of uh, the manufacturer. 
So we have that in, the, in this facility. It actually takes care of measuring every 120 seconds what the EC is or electrical conductivity is of, of the water that or solution that we're feeding the plants with to make sure that we've got the right minerals in there. But then we also measure the pH every 120 seconds and that's done 24 seven. So we're always monitoring that water that's going to the plants to make sure that we're giving the plants the right level of food, but also making sure that that pH is where it needs to be. All right, well, we'll take it from here. We're gonna walk into the greenhouse and so I'm gonna have to put on a, a hairnet and some gloves real quick. And then we'll go out to really where the, the more beautiful portion of our farm exists. So not my favorite look, but a necessary one. So um, it may be a good point. You know, I know I was talking about doing questions at the end, but this is kind of a natural breaking point. Um, if anybody has questions before we move into the greenhouse, I, I would open it up to that now. Susan or Haley, have y'all seen any come through that we might could answer? I have not seen any questions come through, but I do have a question. I was wondering, um, is, is your product available for purchase from the general public or only wholesale? No, it's uh, it's in Whole Foods. It's in Sprouts. Uh, okay. It's in United or Albertsons out in West Texas. Awesome. And uh, Brookshire Brothers, a, a few Brookshire Brothers, really the ones closer to us here physically. Um, Toledo, Lorena. Yeah, Austin. Where? Oh, Wheatsville. Yeah, sorry. Lexi's. Wheatsville, Again, and Lexi does sales for us, so she knows this off the top of the <laughs> And um, what is your your ratio of, of plants that you that don't make it that don't germinate or do you get 100% yield? We do not get 100% yield. We kind of use a 5% uh, target, and really the seeds that come in are rated higher. Um, but it can be a number of different conditions environmentally that could keep those seeds from germinating. Um, we do have times where we'll see 100% germination, but on on average, what we target is a 5% loss over the course of the year. Um, we went through a lot of butterhead probably a month and a half ago that had come in that we were getting 50% germination rates with no other changes. So there are times, it's the first time we've ever had a, what I would consider a bad seed lot, but um, for the most part, we are in that 95% plus germination rate. Thank you. Absolutely. Jason, we did have one other question that came through. They've asked, are there any nutritional differences on hydroponic less, uh, lettuce versus non-hydroponic lettuce? Um, this person said she's curious because she eats lettuce every day for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, there there are. Um, so in the in the field, you, the nutrients that you apply don't necessarily all get into the plant um, because you don't have that same level of finite control that we do. So what we have in the way that we're able to um, create an environment that gives the plant exactly what it needs when it needs it, and and, and con ultimately control um, the environment to help with transpiration, then we're able to make sure that we're getting more of the nutrients that are needed in a more efficient manner to the plant than what we would see in a, in a non-hydroponic sense. So, and we, we, we have a lab that we work with that we'll send that off to, to do nutritional analysis and stuff on the plants as well, just to, to validate that. It's a good question. Excellent. I don't see any additional questions at the moment. Okay. Jason. Well, we'll walk out into the greenhouse then. So we're, uh, we're kind of standing in, a, in, in the middle or in a breaking point between two different ways that we irrigate in the greenhouse. The younger plants come out of germination and they go over to my right here, which is called our nursery or a propagation area. They'll spend about two to three weeks in there. And during their life in that nursery, their watered overhead, which is, you see the boom sprayers up above um, the canopy there, if you will. So with the control system that we have with green automation, we, we dictate what the uh, interval is going to be in terms of when we water. We dictate what the duration of watering is going to be. Um, we dictate the again the mix on, on the on the solution, but we're able to control all those things and say, hey, during the different time of the year and different conditions in the greenhouse, we may want to water more frequently than than in in other times of the year or less frequently than other times of the year. So it gives us that control over um, optimizing what that watering schedule or fertigation schedule should be. A big thing about that. Um, 
ultimately is we collect data every single day. I'm gonna get them, bear with me one second. I'm gonna have them turn off the line. We turned off all the fans so you could hear us, but they're still moving the lines as they harvest. Um, but it allows us ultimately to do data collection. So now we've got a couple of years of data that we've been able to uh, acquire as, as we've done this. And so we then create predictive models for different times of the year and what we wanna do, what we want the parameters to be, whether it's through the fertigation and watering overhead, whether it's through the temperature and humidity control in the greenhouse, um, it could be airflow through the greenhouse, but all the environmental factors that come into play um, are some things that we can tweak by growing inside. So in front of, in front of me here is um, basically a 11-9, about a three week old butterhead uh, crop going in right now. So came out of germination after a couple of days, got set onto the nursery line here, and then we'll spend another couple of days here before it moves over. I'm gonna see if I, bear with me one second. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll flip that around. Thank you. Sorry about that. We're gonna go turn off those, those gutter lines so you don't hear that screeching in the background. Um, so I'll be, I'll, uh, while Lexi goes and does that, I'll, uh, I'll video and try to talk it or present it at the same time. So as we go through nursery, one of the things that I'll point out here is we use a lot of, uh, from a technology standpoint, we use a, a product called 30 megahertz, which is a cloud-based software system that allows us to put sensors throughout the entire facility um, so we're able to measure temperature, not just in one spot, but across the entire facility at different points. We also measure um, relative humidity, um, again, airspeed, uh, moisture uh, in, in, the, in the pods. Uh, we measure uh, PAR or the, the light that we get every day or light intake we get every day. Go ahead, you want to flip that back? So in, in all those cases, as we acquire that data, um, all that is available to us through our phones. So essentially, if we're trying to manage this facility with just people having to go flip louvers and do things, it, we would have a ton more labor wrapped up in it. But because we're able to utilize and leverage that technology, it allows us to have that data acquisition to be able to create those predictive models. But ultimately, um, it helps us to control our labor costs as well. So a little bit of a capital expenditure up front, but in the long run, it's something that paid itself back pretty quickly. Um, as we go through the greenhouse and as Lexi has, has kind of scanned this, we're set up with three growing bays here in Belton. And so we grow a butterhead on, on the first bay that we're standing on right now. On the second bay, and we'll walk over there so you kind of see the color differentiation. So on, on bay two here, we're actually growing a red oak leaf. We're growing a butterhead again, and then we're growing a finstar, which is just that leafy variety that I had mentioned when we first started uh, this uh, Zoom call. So same process throughout. So um, it's nice to have that co consistent definition as we come out here of that process. So we come from germination to nursery across the whole board. It, for us, the way we're laid out is this all moves east to west. And so going across back out to the west, um, we start to see the plants get larger as they go through. So the first part here with the nursery is, is purely a manual process. It's no different than it, in most indoor growth facilities you would go into. Um, they would start with some sort of a manual process to do propagation. Some do them in racks. We, we have it on the horizontal plane here so that we can water with the boom sprayer overhead. Um, but once we get into the second half of the line, it'll actually go into a more automated um, go, or what's called a gutter system. And so We'll get over there in just a second. But one thing before we move over there, I want to point out is just that our water outside of the water that goes on the nursery, all the other water to all the other plants that you see in the back end of the greenhouse is recycled back into a tank. Um, and so we water, it goes across the, the gutter in the plant, the roots uptake that, what they don't, what's discarded comes back into a return gutter, and then it, it flows back into a return tank. And in that return tank is where we're constantly analyzing that water to make sure that we're, we have the right pH and we have the right EC levels in that water. So before it ever allows that water to go back to the plant to feed, it has to hit those target values before it will release it and that pump will start over again and start pushing the water back out to the plants. Um, so in a given month with essentially a little less than an acre, we'll use less than 5,000 gallons of water for the entire facility. So in the, in the summer months when we're using evaporative cooling, just kind of put that in perspective, we go through 100,000 gallons a month that we get that we lose just off of evaporative cooling. But for the plant, from the plant's perspective, we're only using a minimal amount of water. 
So it's a lot more efficient way for us to utilize that precious resource. So one of the other things it does in here is we have shade. So it's activated off of how much sun intake we've had for the day. So when it reaches a certain set point, the shade cloths up top will close. And so it not only does it kind of cut back on the light, but it also helps us control temperature in here as well. down here. So I mentioned earlier, just in terms of, of fertigation and how everything's returned underneath one of our nurture tables and in this pit, everything returns down to thing that this allows to do is instead of utilizing that space up top, which would be area that we could grow plants in, we took it and put it underneath one of the areas that can utilize that space to grow a growing crop while we have that fertigation down in, beneath the plants. So everything's controlled off of the basic glass of brains in this back corner here. Um, we go in there and set all the parameters that we need to the water to, to control the environment out here. Anything that it needs from a growing system perspective goes through that back corner. Um, so everything is used as a programmable logic controller to be able to open valves, close valves, whatever it might take, turn pumps on and off. Um, so it's really at that point in time, once we've set that up and we've established where we want to be, it's really hands off in that perspective. So again, we're not out here every day manually having to do that. So it really allows us to take advantage of, of, of a labor savings significantly, not have to have individual people going around, but it also gives us better control. Um, so it works out really well for us. We're going to walk over past the nursery and we're going to go into the main line here and we'll start to see what that lettuce looks like as it continues to grow. So we go from the nursery on the, on the side that we were just at and then we come over to a, a gutter line. So one of the manual things that we have to do today is, is what's called a transplant. So we go from that 54 count tray into a 63 hole gutter here. And the gutter goes all the way across. It's got these holes in the top that you can see where the plants are, have been uh, placed. And the idea here is we have drip irrigation lines that are pumped, these little black tubes um, that go into a, a hole on the front side of the gutter. That water and food then goes across this gutter and over to the other end on a return tank or into the return uh, uh, tray and then into the tank. And so as these come across, we say we have stickers we put on here that tell uh, anybody looking at what the variety is, what the date was it was planted, and then what the lot, the seed lot it came um, from, which is incredibly important for us because as we know and we talked about earlier with just with lettuce and some of the recalls they've had over the years, um, it's important for us to have that trace back. Um, of it. So if you get a head of lettuce from us, it's got a code on the back of the package and it will tell me exactly which line it came off of, who the harvest crew was, what day it was harvested, and then trace back to the seed lot. So if I had to go all the way back to the seed manufacturer, I could go back and say, hey, we had something happen from that seed lot that you provided us. It may have been six months ago, but at least we have that traceability to go all the way back to where it originated from. Um, these little boxes here are what we call bio boxes. So this is really our, our another round of defense we have from pests. So we actually come every week, we buy beneficial insects, put them in these boxes. They'll actually jump out of these boxes and then they'll take off down the, down the gutter line, chasing after any of the bad bugs that they can find or any of the pests that they can find. Um, very effective. You know, it's allowed us to keep from having to do a, a pesticide spray. So we do see some bugs in the, in the greenhouse naturally. Sometimes people just bring them in with them. Other times that they've, they've gone through the full life cycle and, and come about. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they're able to fight off any of the pests that we have in the facility and keep the lettuce clean. So at this point, we've done a, a spray of a Swarovski mite, which is a leaf mite. So now we've got the hypoacetus in the, in the peat. We've got the Swarovski on the leaves, microscopic, so you'll never see that. Um, but then we also have what's called a, a, a Chrysopa, which is just a green lacewing uh, larvae. And then we also have what's called a Aureus insidious or a minute pirate bug. Um, so those four uh, characters allow us to be able to keep our, our crop clean and free of pests without having to use pesticides.
So one thing I'll point out here is right now when we come over from the nursery into uh, the gutter line, all of the gutters are right up against each other. So we're maximizing our, our utilization of this space by keeping them as close together as we can right now. What you'll see as we go down the line and as the lettuce starts to mature, we'll start to spread that out through an automation process that gives it more space to grow into. So we're always just trying to use the amount of space that it needs to grow into, not anything beyond that. So uh, one of the other devices we use through 30 megahertz is actually another microclimate sensor, but it actually has a, a little sensor extension on it. So what this allows us to do is it's one thing to understand the environment in the entire greenhouse. It's another thing to really understand what the environment is right in the middle of the plant. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters to us is what's going on at the plant, what the plant's experiencing. Um, so we collect data there. Um, one of the most important things that we look at and we measure is called vapor pressure deficit. And all that is, is basically the pressure outside the plant leaf relative to the pressure inside. Because if they're out of whack, either you can't, the plant can't transpire and can't grow as it needs to, or the opposite of that is it's transpiring too quickly. And then it essentially is exerting all this energy and it's wasted. It's not actually able to grow at an optimal level. So we take that data from those, make sure that the plant's existing in an environment that's best for it. And then we tweak it if we need to based off of what we see. This is also the first place where you start to see that separation of the gutters. And so the plant's at a point, um, a few, about a, at this point in time, it's about, in this case, it's about a month old. And so you start to see the spacing go through as the gutters start to separate. So we're just creating that space for them to grow into. And then the rest of it is we go down really kind of more of the same. So now we get this football field stretch, if you will, where they're growing. Um, as they go through it, they're starting to space out a little bit more to go into that space, but the rest of it just follows the line. So as we harvest off each day, which we'll get to here in just a second, we're moving that line towards us. And then we're coming back from the other end here, putting the gutters back down on the end and then planting from the nursery back into those gutters and restarting that cycle. One of the other things we measure is called PAR, or photosynthetically active radiation. So that's the, basically, this is how we're measuring the light that we get. There's a, a sensor on the end here, and then there's another one over there. And that allows us to make sure that we're keeping shades open, that we're maximizing whatever sun we need in a day to make sure that we get to a target value for, for light intake. And I point that out because on, on bay one, some of you may have noticed this already, there's lights on bay one, but we don't have them all over the other two bays. Um, so that line allows us with that supplemental lighting to grow things differently um, in, in, a, in a morphology way. So we can actually plant a seed under light will behave one way without the lights behaves a different way. So it gives us a little bit of tweaking that we can do with the product that we ultimately uh, create and sell. We'll walk all the way down to the end and then pick up on the harvest. point out while we're out here too so the blue and yellow cards that you see throughout the facility are just essentially bug traps so they're scouting cards so one of the things that um, our, our uh, team member that handles IPM or integrated pest management does she'll come around and look at this and and see where there might be an infestation or concentration um, that she needs to address differently so it's just a way for us to walk by and have a visual management uh, methodology to be able to understand if the uh, pest pressure has gone up or if it's staying the same or has gone down This is definitely starting to look at this point more like lettuce that you would buy and, and ultimately eat. Um, this is our Finstar, which is a unique, oh yeah, thank you, Lexi. So, which is a, a, a varietal that we found when we were in Finland. So obviously they're very proud of it because they named it Finstar. Um, but it's also something that's extremely crunchy, crunchy and has a, a good water content to it. Um, Lexi grabbed a sachet right here. So 
uh, one of the sort ways we apply Swarovski mites is they just come in a little sachet and then at the front, they'll put that into the pot here. And then there's a little hole in this that the Swarovski mites will come out of and then basically get onto the leaves of the plant and then live their life there on those leaves. Very effective. This brings us down to our harvest end. And so all the products moving to the west here, they come, the gutters move. They come, you can see Chase and, and Caleb down there are in the, in the middle of harvesting. They're taking a knife, cutting the, at the base of the plant, separating it from that peat pot, putting the good product onto a finished goods conveyor. And then ultimately any, anything bad or any waste goes onto the bottom conveyor and out to a, a compactor. So at this point in time, this plant's about 50 days old. Um, Pretty nice, big fin start. We have some butter that we grow here. We have some butter that we grow here as well. Uh, and then a red oak leaf. So we'll kind of move out of this fairly quickly just because it's a little bit louder. It'd be much harder to hear me. So we'll, we'll kind of show this from a video perspective. Um, it's a little bit noisier in here, so I apologize for that, but they're in the middle of, of packaging product. So right now they're taking it as a good product. In this case, it's butterhead comes off the end of the line into a bin and transferring that over to pack station. So they take it, put it into a clamshell container, like you can see with Michaela right here. So they'll do a QA on the on the product, make sure that it meets the quality that we want to uh, ship out to the customer, and then they'll fit it into a clamshell, close that, and then put it onto a rotating table there where they'll get a band applied to it. So that's our branding at that point that we apply. So that closed clamshell then comes over to a bander. And so we have different bands that we use for different retail products. In this case right now, they're doing baby butter, which is a two head um, of, a, of a more tight compact uh, product. So thank you, Justin. So you can see the, the labeling there, the brand. And then on the back, like I mentioned earlier, there'll be a lock code at the bottom. So we can trace back exactly where this came from when it was essentially when it was harvested and, and packaged. That gives us the ability to trace that all the way back to the seed lot. So they'll make those up, put them into a box at this point, or into what we call a case. A case will go through, will go through a taper and then it'll slide down a conveyor into a, onto a pallet where it will be stacked and then wrapped for, uh, for shipment. So that, yeah, we can show you the cold storage too. Uh, everything comes off of that once it's packaged in a few minutes. It'll move from there really quickly into cold storage. So everything in here will turn over in the next couple of days. 
So this everything it looks for right now, they'll turn over, be on a truck, uh, shipping either through wholesale or retail channels, and then ultimately end up on somebody's plate somewhere. But it's uh, 41 degrees in here right now, <laughs> so we'll move out of this pretty quickly. Then from there, we, we basically have what's called a, a continuous loop. So it just starts kind of all over again. So we exit the pack house, come back into the head house and where we started, um, we'll wash trays, we'll add, start the peat breaker over again, and then we'll go through that whole process. And we do that every day. Um, so it's the same continual process, five days a week, I should say, um, that we do in order to put out about a million and a half plants a year. So. With that said, we'll walk back up front um, and then open it up for any questions that y'all might have. Thanks. Thanks um, so much for sharing, Jason. Every time um, if I go in, I am just enthralled by the whole operation. And so I hope you all got a little bit of a glimpse into it and enjoyed seeing it. Um, a couple of things I'll tell you. Um, one, I've had the pleasure of visiting um, Jason's operation there and he's and I've had their lettuce and it is wonderful so if you ever have the opportunity to grab some um, in the store definitely do it so that you can give it a try because it's good stuff um, and Jason's headed back and then we do have a couple of questions I see that have come through um, but thank you again so much Jason um, it's a neat operation so like I said I hope you all enjoyed it <laughs> I thoroughly Absolutely. enjoyed that. I think it was a wonderful presentation. And my only complaint is I wish we could have a taste. It all <laughs> is just so fresh and such a variety. I, I can't wait. I'm ready for a field trip. For sure. Are you ready for some questions, Jason? A Absolutely. Uh, we have one question. <clears throat> what is the most popular variety of lettuce that you grow? Uh, it's definitely butter. Yeah. So we, we started um, thinking, my, my business partner, Marshall, and I thought, hey, we're just going to be a butter farm. And then we started getting into it and realizing, hey, we probably want some variety there, um, some diversification, if you will. And so we've gone through, I've planted and, and harvested 50 plus varieties of, of lettuce. Um, we've kind of settled on the three we grow now, but butter still has continued to come back around is probably the favorite that um, certainly what we sell the most of and particularly in the retail space. Great, thank you. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, how long does the lettuce last once it's picked? So we publish three weeks. Um, so really? keeping it in cold storage, um, that's our agreement with with the uh, with the retailers and stuff that we have. I think Lexi, you said it's eleven days that we have to. Yeah. So yeah, that that like Whole Foods needs it. It's got to be eleven days. Um, so. I, as a matter of fact, so I'll, I'll back up what I say there. I, I pulled um, that lunch yesterday, went back there. My wife had asked me to bring home some lettuce. So I went back there and pulled heads that were right at three weeks old out of cold storage, went home and ate it. And I, I, I w literally couldn't tell the difference between it and what we harvested that day. So um, if it's stored in proper conditions, it will it will last a long time, maybe too long <laughs> from our yeah, I'll perspective. Second that. I'll second that from Jason. So when he when I was there visiting and he gave me some... Um, I took it home and I think I actually had it fresh in my fridge, eating it for like sandwiches and things for like four weeks. And it, um, I know that sounds crazy and I don't know if he wants us to tell you that, but that's how fresh <laughs> that stuff is. So um, keep that Thank in you, mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, what is the maximum output of your, of the product for your farm? How many heads can you put out? So it, it does depend somewhat on environmental conditions, seasonality wise. So we do, even though we're indoors, we still have a summer uh, versus a winter season, just because of the amount of, of light intake that we can get in a given day. Um, it'll go, any, we, we kind of say, we safely say 1.2 million heads out of this facility. Um, we could grow north of that, but in terms of when we do planning, that's the number that we use. We're uh, in the process right now of finalizing um, our funding on phase two, um, which will basically triple the size of the farm we are right now maybe uh, quintuple the size, uh, depending on which direction we go. Um, but that would put us somewhere in that seven, ultimately in that seven and a half, eight million heads a year. Wow, that's great. Uh, I have a question about um, when you expand, do you, do you ever see yourself doing um, any herbs, basil, oregano, or anything like that? For sure. So we, we've grown it. We've grown microgreens here and we've grown herbs. 
Um, we, we've been blessed with a really good Genovese basil. Um, we just, the way that the system's designed today, it's not efficient or cost effective for us to do. So the gutter design in the new facility is actually, instead of having holes in it, like we just walked through, it's actually an open top. And so we can get denser planting into that tray to be able to grow those other uh, crops that, that do better in, um, in, in a denser environment than just in, a, in the one we have today for head lettuce. So thank you for, um, so when we, Go to our grocery store. We look for True Harvest Farm. Yep, True Is Harvest. Farm. the label? Okay. Yep, yep. Sprout right. Foods and United Albertsons. And okay. one thing that I'll say uh, for Jason and Marshall and their team there, they are super open to um, educational purposes. And so um, they want people to learn. And um, that's one thing I love about partnering with them. They're passionate about that. So um, one thing to keep in mind, if you're ever interested in connecting with them, um, individually or you're in the area and you, you know, want to take a look there at the operation, they're, they're usually open to that. So if y'all um, have questions or are interested, feel free to email me. Haley and Susan have my contact information. I'd be happy to put you in contact with Jason um, and their team. For sure. Great. Thank you. Um, before we close, are there any other questions? Um, students have questions or educators? Well, keep in mind that this is recorded and it will live on our live in our library. Oh, we do have one more question. Have you partnered with any local farm to table restaurants? Um, we so we started off doing just restaurants when we went, went to market back in August last year. Um, today, we've kind of reduced that the, the restaurant side of our business because we're doing that. We're, we're not really in distribution, um, but we have kept um, a few of them that are we consider part of our community here. Um, so in Waco, we have 135 Prime and Diamondbacks, and then Magnolia Table is a customer of ours. Magnolia Table is probably one of our best customers, in fact. Um, and then we also, in, in the Temple area, have Bird Creek and, and Trino. And then it go down. we extend that down to Salado with the Shed and Alexander's and uh, McCain's. Um, but just recognizing that at the end of the day, we, we want to be a, a grower and, and not necessarily in the distribution side. Um, we had to kind of cut back on that. So what we did is hand those off to the wholesalers that, um, provide services to those particular restaurants, but we, I miss that part of it selfishly. Like those, those relationships when, you know, when my wife and I go to eat dinner somewhere, it, it's just a sense of pride when you see your name on the menu. Um, and, and we love their products as much as they love ours. So it's just a, a natural relationship to want to want to keep. Well, once again, this was a great, um, lesson, uh, learning lesson and fun to watch and just see the whole process. It's so much more involved than I ever would have thought. Um, and for the, the students and the educators, um, this is another, you know, classroom to career opportunity that, you know, the farm and everything that, um, that offers is, a. a potential path for each of you. So if you do have any more questions, um, send them over to Haley and we can get them to Jordan and Jason to answer. But for now, we'll go ahead and, and close this session. I appreciate both of your time and energy and exploring this world with us. Sure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.